Hello, and welcome to the Internet of Things episode of Spark Talks, where we'll be talking about the specifics of PR and marketing as they relate to IoT companies. And by the way, did you know that a study by Marketo estimated 2.9 billion connected devices in the world in 2015 and predicts that we will have over 13 billion by 2020? I'm your host, Spark's marketing manager, Vanessa Zucker. You can tweet me at SparkPR with all of your questions and contributions to the show. Today's guests include Jeff Ku, vice president in the consumer group here at Spark. He can be reached Yo. at Jeff Ku2, the number two, on Twitter. We also have Shane Jordan, VP of strategic communications, and Alex Romero Wilson, senior analyst. Howdy, glad to be here. You can tweet Shane at Shane underscore Jordan and Alex at AnthroFoodie. Jeff, can you quickly explain what IoT is? And then can each of you tell me just a little bit about your experience with IoT? Yeah, IoT is really a trend of um, software and hardware coming together to bring um, devices online. Uh, what we're finding is that um, a lot of devices can be made much better and more valuable to consumers through the application of the internet, uh, you know, through continued updates, uh, more data uh, given to companies about the way products are being used by consumers, uh, and in general, advantages of having devices networked. And what is your experience with IoT? I guess I've always been interested in IoT and gadgets in particular. It's part of the reason why I joined Spark. Um, when I um, had the opportunity to go after Lowe's Iris, I guess is when I really started doing a lot more work um, in IoT. We launched their connected home platform uh, and then also helped launch their uh, ecosystem of partners at CES. Um, since then, you know, I've worked with a number of other IoT companies. Dropcam was a great example of a company that we worked with for 18 months. We really helped shift and elevate their brand towards a more consumer facing brand. Um, we really focused on DIY home security and giving consumers an idea of why they would want to have a camera on 24-7 in their house recording to the cloud. Um, we worked with them up through their acquisition by Nest uh, for half a billion. Um, since then, we've worked with some other really great companies. Cassia Hub is another example. They uh, were essentially an unknown startup when we st first started working with them. And you know, through media education and submitting for awards and taking them to CES, we were able to get them to a point where they were able to win best of CES in the connected home category, which is huge for them. It helped drive a lot of new partner deals. Uh, and they beat out major, major companies like like LG, for example. Oh, wow. All right, Shane, Alex, you guys tell me what your experience is with IoT. Uh, this is Shane. So I guess, you know, most of my experience with IoT really comes, you know, kind of like Jeff was speaking about, I was working with, you know, some really great clients out there who have uh, been developing IoT technologies and um, products that go along with that. And so uh, I do enjoy, you know, IoT as far as uh, the products I do have, uh, some of those things in my home. But, you know, I really am fascinated by the entire category in that it is, you know, as Jeff mentioned, really connecting things and really um, allows a lot of the, the things that we use every day or new technologies coming to really talk to each other and optimize themselves, you know, for our personal experiences, which, um, you know, is this kind of where we've been going with technology in general. So um, I think it's just an amazing space. I think it's certainly got a, a, a huge future. I think we're just on the precipice of that. And I'm really excited to see what happens over the next few years and really excited to, you know, continue to work with the amazing team here at Spark that has really done an amazing job in, uh, in our IoT practice and, and really delivering impactful results uh, within this category. Yeah, Alex here. My response really echoes both Jeff and Shane's where my experience kind of stems from working with various IoT clients and here at Spark and other previous agencies. But my fascination in IoT really comes from a data and marketing perspective, which I know we'll touch on later today, and how all of this really customer data that's kind of being from, you know, if you think of the 
um, the Amazon buttons that they've or that they're selling now, where you can press a button and it might order like a new Tide product right oh, from yeah. Amazon or whatever. You know, and like how having access to that data and kind of customer trends and all that consumer knowledge and how companies will then use that data to advertise and retarget customers. It's just an interesting relationship how now like machines will provide more data and insight to companies. Right. Or your housekeeper could accidentally order a huge box <laughs> of toilet paper while you're on vacation, which is what happened in my house when sh- when someone pressed the Cottonelle button. Oh. So, fair enough to say you're all stocked up. Yeah. All right, here's a question for you, Jeff. What are the unique challenges IoT companies face in terms of PR and does it differ for large versus small companies? Wow, that is a huge question. I mean, in the world of IoT startups and um, I guess IoT products from bigger brands, there are a number of challenges, both on a regulation front and a PR front. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that you're seeing from um, that startups face uh, when they're looking to sell their products to consumers is establishing um, the sense that they will be actually around uh, in the next year or two. Um, I think you know, when Nest acquired Revolve and then shut it down, it kind of introduced this huge problem for at least um, connected home devices uh, because, you know, all of a sudden all these people who had invested in their connected home with Revolve had a system that was no longer functional. And it created a lot of concern about, uh, you know, whether or not consumers should be buying into some of these products that, you know, traditionally would have lasted much longer. Um, Aside from the uncertainty thing, there's also the regulation thing. So one of the things we're seeing right now in San Francisco is that um, Uber is battling the city, uh, the California DMV with their self-driving cars. You know, there's a lot of gray area right now with uh, um, IoT and certainly a lot of innovation and companies have to decide like, you know, is this a risk that we're going to take and kind of operate in this gray area. Some other interesting things that you're seeing are uh, drone delivery. Um, Like today we saw um, 7-Eleven actually beat out Google and Amazon for the first uh, drone deliveries in the United States through a, a project that they did in Reno. I thought that was amazing. But you know, I just wanted to jump in real quick. Sorry, not to lose your train of thought. We just watched a video with uh, Casey Neistat, and he was actually it was it was made in conjunction with Samsung, and he was actually he mentioned in the beginning of the video there haven't been any drones yet that have been developed to carry people, and you can search for this video on YouTube. I think it just came out today, and it basically shows that they created a drone that carries somebody and he was taking it on a snowboard run and it was carrying him rather than taking a chairlift the drone was literally carrying him to the top of the hill and all around town and he was snowboarding behind it so if you get a chance check out that video um, a little bit in line with what we're talking about that is a good (laughs) PR stunt right there indeed yeah some other challenges I think involve security Um, A lot of uh, companies make products, but they don't necessarily think about how secure the back end is. And this is particularly true with larger companies that, um, you know, want to connect their devices, but by nature are not um, internet security experts. You know, they they make washing machines and refrigerators. Mm. Uh, But when these companies make products that are connected to the internet, oftentimes security is kind of slapped on as a Band-Aid. And there are definitely some problems with that, you know, particularly if you have a camera in your home or a refrigerator that's sending a thousand emails to Netflix a day to try to shut them down, as, you know, we saw earlier this year. Uh, A lot of those devices were hacked into and created massive traffic to shut down uh, internet servers. Remember when when uh, Puff Daddy came out with that song, Mo Money, Mo Problems? It's kind of <laughs> like Mo Connectivity, Mo Problems, right? <laughs> totally. I mean, where we are right now. But, um, you know, I, I think as history has proven, those things will eventually get smoothed over. And uh, and, and I do see a you know a clear vision in the future of, of everything being much more interconnected and, and seamless with that experience. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest challenges for any startup that's looking to do PR for themselves and to promote their products is establishing what exactly is the uh, value or the problem that they're solving for a consumer. A lot of times consumers 
are happy with the status quo. Like they don't understand why a coffee maker needs to be connected to the internet or why a door handle and lock should be connected to the internet. And for some consumers, they fear the security aspect so much that they don't even want that. But our job here with Spark and all, our, all of our clients is to help explain and educate people on you know, what are these advantages and how small things like being able to unlock your door when you're halfway around the world can be a huge lifesaver for you. Now, one thing that gets talked about a lot when it comes to IoT is big data. What role does data play in advising marketing for an IoT company? Well, I think it's interesting when we talk about big data and making big data applicable, especially in marketing. Um, I feel like big data was the what the buzzword of 2014, 2013. Every time, oh, big data, it's just going to revolutionize the entire universe and how we're going to have all this data and it's going to tell us everything about our consumers and how we can better our products and make better machines, et cetera, et cetera. But now what's happening is that all of these companies have all of this data. And what do you do with it? I mean, that's the big question now is how can we make all of this data that we've collected applicable and actionable? And we're seeing, a, and this is kind of like, because now we're kind of seeing the rise of MarTech and ad tech and a lot of these now integrations of marketing softwares that are tapping into big data networks. You know, now these companies have all this data, so now they've collected it all, all the infra infrastructure's there and all the storage is there, which is fantastic, we have the cloud, et cetera. So they have it all, and now we're seeing the next kind of wave into MarTech and ad tech and where they're allowing these companies to access their data and correlate and integrate all of their data points together and to make it actionable. So it's, an, it's a really interesting time to with personalized marketing, that's kind of a big trend that we're seeing now where since you know so much about your customer through various kind of retargeting and other creepy data, quote unquote, um, that you can really understand an entire customer's life cycle much quicker than we've not really been able to before and understand all of their purchases from cross platforms, multi devices, cross channels all over the connected and non connected world um, to paint a complete you know persona of their customer. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's definitely, it, to be in marketing now is one of the most interesting times, I think, in history. This is Shane, I totally agree uh, with Alex was saying, and just to kind of break that down into more of a real life scenario a bit. Uh, for example, um, we're working with a, a new company that um, is in the IoT space and really focused on you know lighting and being able to control sound and really being able to control so many other connected devices from one uh, platform within your home and like an Alexa for example people are limited into their control over Alexa and you know through data we're able to understand that Alexa customers can use this product to get more out of their products now I mean this an article came out yesterday that was updating like Mark Zuckerberg's conquest of Jarvis which is his home connectivity that he's designed himself basically which connects you know Alexa and he has a Sono system and whatever else he has in his house um, I have that oh my gosh and he's been able to develop um, he's written his own software that's been able to communicate very effectively and I mean this ties to the data the data and the customization aspect where his system will recognize the difference between like him and his wife like the voice and the preferences and the time of day like when he speaks in a specific time it will like know exactly what kind of music to play or what to order for dinner like yeah that being, I don't have being into that sophistication of personalization with connectivity and IOT like that's something that's this brand new now but I mean you're definitely gonna see in a few years off that's gonna be something that's gonna be everywhere well, it's interesting. You just totally reminded me of something that I had heard of, gosh, at least 10 years ago. And I remember um, Bill Gates was developing something for the inside of his. He had like the most, you know, tech home mm. that was out there. And he was able to walk into a room and then I think maybe say something or push a button. And the entire scene of the room would transform itself into whatever kind of emotional or whatever state that he wanted to be in. So he could turn all the lights into one color, turn on a certain sound, turn on, and so it was a, probably one of the first instances of what a true kind of full connected home might look like, and of course it was built by Bill Gates, you know, at least 10 years ago and probably cost, you know, ridiculous amounts of money, but, you know, we were talking about the first instances we started hearing about this stuff, and I think that's the first time I really started understanding what a connected home might be, but be like, and then so hearing that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's doing something on a, you know, similar but on another level today, it's just interesting that these kind of, you know, big luminaries or these major companies are able to kind of really drive future trends forward. Yeah, and I think that we're reading about all these big luminaries 
being able to develop these softwares and kind of emblemize and symbolize what the future of IoT will be, especially in the consumer home. But I mean, now if we're looking at kind of an adoption scale and you know the tipping point, we're definitely not there yet. And you can see that reflected in the market where as a consumer, you're kind of confused like, do I, ad like, you can't, like, at least from my understanding, is there's really no company that offers a complete IoT home solution. Like, if I wanted to say, I want, like, drop cam, and I want, like, a, like a door, and I want lights, and I want all this stuff, and I want Sonos, you know, there's not one company that does the whole package, so I kind of have to piecemeal all my solutions together, and then kind of find a hub that connects all of them together as well. And I think that can be a challenge from, like, a PR perspective, is that, you know, as a consumer, I don't know, but maybe there are, and I don't know about these companies or these new companies coming up that are actually helping to make this process a lot easier. Well, yeah, I guess to kind of add to that, I mean, there are companies that integrate your entire smart home, but they're like thousands, thousands and thousands, and thousands, of, thousands of dollars, right? right? So yeah. like, if you're building a custom home, yeah, you can like add in all these systems, but it'll cost you a pretty penny. But I think what you're saying is that for the average consumer who is putting together their smart home by buying, you know, bits and pieces like a drop cam right. here or Nest thermostat there, there's not one great solution that kind of integrates everything into one interface. And that's kind of the area that is the most exciting for me right now. And, um, you know, there are a number of companies that I think are racing to kind of own this space. and. Um, you know, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm just very excited to see what happens. So it sounds like you guys are predicting that in the future, your average consumer will be able to have a totally connected home. Is there anything else you guys have for what's next in IoT? I think voice control is going to be really big. Um, voice control was one of those things that even maybe five years ago was just totally laughable. Like people had horrible experiences with, um, you know, trying to control things by voice. But, um, you know, as the systems have improved and, and learned um, how to interpret uh natural language processing, uh, things have gotten exponentially better. Every voice-driven uh, search inquiry that you put in through Google or Siri kind of adds to the smartness of the whole system. And it, the smart home is one of the number one reasons why people buy Amazon Echo, because they know that they can control things like their Philips Hue or their Nest thermostat uh, through uh, voice. It's, I mean, certainly why I bought one, because I wanted, I got tired of having to pull out my phone every time I wanted to like turn on the lights. Yeah, and this is Shane. I, I think just and just personalization in general. You know, the the devices, the platforms, all understanding uh, the consumer that much better, and really personalizing the experience so that you know when you walk in your home, you don't get just to choose between lights on or off or music on or off. It's the color, it's the type of music, it's very specific into a certain let's say scenes or environments that you want to create. So I think really personalization is the next huge forefront. Jeff, I have to ask you this because you've been talking about all these IoT products that you know about and some that you own. Just how many IoT products do you own? Oh, God. Um, I own an embarrassingly large amount <laughs> of IoT products. Um, I mean, I'm not even counting stuff like the smart TV or like the internet connected soundbar because that stuff isn't that smart. Um, but like, so I own three drop cams, which is crazy because I live in like a 700 square foot apartment. Um, I own an Innova precision cooker, which is Wi-Fi connected. I have two tiles. I have a Belkin Wemo. I have a Philips Hue system. I have a Nest thermostat, a Nest Protect. I have an Amazon Echo and a Dot. And, uh, oh, and a Dash, as I mentioned earlier. And I have some Sonos speakers. And very soon, I will have a Naked Labs uh, 3D fitness mirror. <laughs> Let us know when you're having a yard sale. <laughs> well, I have a question then. I mean, since you're such a big early adopter of all these technologies, has it made any part of your life 
Other than it being a fascination for you, though, like has it made any part of your day or doing normal tasks easier? Yeah, I mean, definitely there's a huge value in being able to see what's going on at home. I love my drop cams because, uh, you know, something happens and you're like, well, how did that happen? You can review your drop cam. Like, I learned so much more about my house just being able to, to see that. But then sometimes I feel like a crazy person because I'm just shouting at... Alexa to like turn on the lights in the specific way that I want, right? Because <laughs> the personalization aspect yeah. hasn't quite gotten there. So um, I don't know. Like sometimes it's a wash. Uh, like for instance, one day I was at work and I got an alert that my smoke detector detected smoke. And then my drop cam turned on, and I saw nothing. Well, I went back home just to be safe, and then later on I Googled that day and found out that the particular connected smoke sensor that I had had this problem of sometimes falsely creating um, smoke-detected alerts. So Ooh. the drop cam helped me, yeah. but then the other device didn't. So hmm. Interesting. Shane, Alex, do you guys have any interesting devices? Um, I don't have as many as Jeff. I do have a really cool Bluetooth toothbrush, which I don't know if that counts. <laughs> I actually don't have the app for my phone, but you can download an app on your phone, and it actually will keep track of like how long you brush your teeth and like what head you should be using on what day. It's kind of ridiculous. I thought about getting that. And it actually, it's actually what's cool is there's a little thing you can stick on your wall and it has a timer on it and it, it gives you a smiley face rating if you do the full two minutes. So my dad came over a couple months ago and he's like, why is there a smiley face on the wall of your bathroom? I'm like, oh yeah, well it lets you know if you brush your teeth long enough. It's really cool. He just kind of stared at me like I was ridiculous. Um, I am looking at getting a Sono system for my small apartment, but Do I it. think it would be cool. I think it, it's just interesting how you talked about, you know, like why upgrade to an IoT device, like a Sonos versus buying a traditional like a sound bar. And the one benefit definitely being it's internet connected and it will update. For like indefinitely, so you know maybe the hardware would out, be out of date, but the software and the quality of the sound can complete you know can update constantly to the the, the next best thing, which definitely, at least in my mind and no opinion, is a, is a reason to adopt connected devices. Shane, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, I actually have uh, two uh, pieces of uh, I two IoT devices in my house. Neither of them I purchased. One of them is from the um, Osram Sylvania's Lightify line, which actually won in a contest, and they sent me about, I don't know, about $400 worth of, uh, of, of connected lights, um, which work through the app, which has had uh, varying levels of success. Um, it would be nice to just use uh, the wall as was designed to turn the lights on and off and have some of those controls. But uh, I found that um, you know it's it's in this clunky app, and so that's one of them. Um, and I you know to be honest, I I played with that. I had that on for maybe a month or so, and then um, just you know from all the struggles, became disenchanted with that device. And then also um, I have a. Misfit, the company that makes um, wearables, they were a competitor to Fitbit and were acquired, I believe, last year by fossil makers of the fine white fossil watch as made famous on the Jersey Shore by uh, from an Angelina, a present to Angelina, if you remember. Anyhow, um, so I have those two devices. I use the I use the Misfit one every now and again to create a red light in my the back of my kitchen to impress my neighbors. That is the extent <laughs> of my use with that. Um, so I think that they are all, uh, all these, indiv all these devices are great. I would love to have a sound bar and all of that or Sonos. Unfortunately, I also live in a very small apartment with neighbors basically right on the other side of the wall. They can hear everything already. So amplifying that sound would not be conducive to, uh, maintaining relationships with my neighbors. But yeah, that's pretty much my experience with IOT. I also wanted to just give a quick shout out to a couple individuals since we're on this topic. A uh, great friend of mine and of my family's gentleman, fine gentleman named Brian Bailey works on the Nest team over at Google and also want to give a shout out to another Google designer my buddy Michael Dunn who is just uh, shared the fantastic news that he and his wife Lisa are
are expecting a child who will be certainly an IoT native as it grows up within its lifetime. And all of these challenges that we we're talking about today, that child will pretty much um, have a seamless experience in dealing with. So we look forward to that. I thought you were about to say that child will be internet connected. <laughs> <laughs> with the way we're going, that's not that's probably possible. too far off. <laughs> that's great. All right. Well, thanks, you guys, for being on this podcast. Thank you. And audience, remember to tweet me at SparkPR with all your questions and concerns. Tell me what IoT devices you have and whether you have a good experience with them or not. And make sure to use the hashtag SparkTalks. I'll get back to you on a future podcast. Oh, and if you're going to be at CES, feel free to send me a tweet. I'll be doing all kinds of things with fun uh, clients, media, and parties there. Tweet him at Jeff Koo, too. We don't know who Jeff Koo one is. Get that more blocked out and see the bottom line. Spark, spark, spark.